All right, morning, everyone. So um, it's uh, um, my pleasure to um, introduce uh, Dr. Fr uh, uh, Diego Friedenreich. Um, I've, um, I've, I've met him once before at the American Heart Association very briefly, but I have to say that um, I've admired his work for many years, and um, I think he's put out some very important papers on um, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy over the last um, uh, decade or so, and I think made some really important advances on understanding how um, Connection 43, um, and yes, graduate students, Connection 43 wasn't mentioned today, so they can go on the, the mark list. Um, that contributes to that um, that that awful pathology, and so you know I've enjoyed every one of his papers. They're um, a model of um, a rigor and um, and logic, and um, taught, taught us many new things. So uh, Dr. Friedenreich um, got his PhD um, in biochemistry at the University of Buenos Aires in um, Argentina in '94. Um, he came to the United States. Um, um, around the turn of the millennium to be a Pew Fellow of Developmental Biology at uh, New York University School of Medicine. Um, he went on to do postdoctoral work and also as a senior research fellow um, in stem cells at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer in, uh, Center in New York uh, and did some quite important work there um, on understanding um, how uh, paracrine factors secreted by stem cells um, are uh, a key part of the way that stem cells um, uh, have regenerative uh, properties. So, um, you know, that that soon became something uh, of uh, a key understanding for people in the field and um, some, some very important work there. Um, as I say, more lately, he has uh, been on muscular dystrophy, and that's what he's going to talk about today. And so it's with very great pleasure that um, I introduce to you um, Dr. Fradenreich. Hear me? Thank you. There's a little box there on your presentation. You can close that out. Um, oh, the one on the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out there. Well, thank you very much, Robert, uh, for the introduction. I am very, very happy to to visit this institution. Uh, uh, it's funny, uh, last night at the table, uh, I knew mostly everyone, uh, which was, and, and we had a lot of fun with it. And it's good to discuss science with the premier kind of group. Um, so um, today, or my lab, uh, we are, uh, we study, uh, for the most part, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and associated cardiomyopathy. And I will tell you a story about the new role of Connexin 43 in this system. So the question that I would like to, I would like to uh, ask is, we have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We have cardiomyopathy associated with DMD, what's the role or what's the connection with Connexin 43? So this is how we uh, uh, laid out the uh, presentation. I'll give you a little bit of background, uh, mainly about muscular dystrophy and connexins. Um, then we'll talk about Connexin 43 remodeling in the heart. Um, and I will move away a little bit to describe uh, uh, just preliminary experiments or preliminary results about the potential role of Connexin 43 in the skeletal muscle. Then we'll go back to the heart and establish a connection between uh, phosphoconnexin 43 and the microtubules. And finally, I'll uh, share with you our working model.
So DMD is an X-linked fatal degenerative disease of the skeletal muscle and the heart. Uh, you know, the culprit is uh, several mutations in the gene muscarine. That was described like 30, 30 plus, 35 or even 40 years ago, but yet there's no cure. There are hopes though, uh, for example, antisense oligonucleotides that skip exons that are mutated and dystrophin is very repetitive. So it doesn't really matter if we skip one or two exons. AV microdystrophins, dystrophin is very big to be encapsulated in an, in an AAV. So uh, people tried first the mini dystrophins, then the micro dystrophins, uh, very, very small versions of dystrophin. <laughs> Premature termination caught on skipping or uh, lately CRISPR-Cas or um, base editors. The gold standard is these days, unfortunately, steroids with more side effects than benefits, particularly if we uh, talk about the, uh, the children. Unlike the uh, skeletal muscle, the uh, dystrophic heart has been understudied and uh, has become the major uh, cause of morbidity and mortality. There are alternative treatment targets uh, 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 in addition to trying to put back dystrophin and uh, make dystrophin um, uh, express in the system. Uh, some targets, inflammation, nitric oxide, oxidative stress, myostatin, folistatin, eutrophin. But there's the, the, the reality is that there's still no cure. So in addition to dystrophy, which is a very large subsarcolemma protein, there are other members that conform the dystrophy glycoprotein complex. And together, they are responsible for linking the extracellular matrix with the cytoskeleton. And they protect the muscle from uh, mechanical damage. But in the absence of dystrophy, the whole complex is uh, unstable and destroyed. And that uh, leads to muscular dystrophy with some uh, uh, phenotypes like oxid or some uh, pathological events like oxidative stress, calcium overload, arrhythmias, cell death. But the link between dystrophy destruction and all the downstream uh, uh, pathways or uh, affected is elusive. The dystrophy restoration is challenging. As I mentioned before, the gene is very large. It conforms 0.1% of a whole human genome, 78. Uh, exons, very, very large, very difficult to put into effect. But we are not interested at this point in restoring dystrophy. Our lab is not interested. What we are interested in is in identifying and correcting key downstream factors or pathways that are affected by the loss of dystrophy and try to restore those secondary mechanisms, but what would these factors be? And then we became interested in Connexin 43 because of its role in the arrhythmias. DMD children, they do have arrhythmias. So Connexin 43 um, is a member or uh, um, conforms the gap junction channel at the intercalated disc with a very, very distinct um, uh, pattern of localization. This happens, or this is the, uh, the normal heart. And 
is um, um, the, uh, the gap junction channel connects cell A with cell B and connects in 43, therefore is responsible for the electrical propagation of the signal in the heart. When there is a coupling of two M jumps at the intercalated disc or at the uh, short uh, segment uh, of, the, uh, of the rectangle. But in pathological conditions, like in, in, a, in an ischemic heart, connecting 43, which is normally localized to the intercalated disc, uh, moves away or re, uh, uh, remodels away of the uh, uh, intercalated disc and as such doesn't conform the gap junction channel. It stays as a hemichannel. And by being a hemichannel, it connects the extracellular space with the cardiac mouse site. And that is bad because it could lead to ATP release or decreasing the energetics of the cardiac mouse site, calcium overload that would all together lead to arrhythmias and cell death. So just for you to keep in mind, there is a good connection and a bad connection. When connection is at the intercalated disc forming the gut junction channel, that is the good one, the green. And the one that is lateralized is how we call it, or remodel is the bad connection, the hemichannel that causes the arrhythmia. So we're going to talk about connecting remodeling now. So we wanted to see if there was a correlation between connecting 43 remodeling and severity of disease in mice, in mouse models. We have three different mouse models that uh, one is mild, the MDX mouse, one is intermediate, MDX eutrophin plus minus mice. Eutrophin compensates for the absence of dystrophin. So when, no, when there is no dystrophin, like in muscular dystrophy, eutrophin goes up and compensates, excuse me, and compensates for its absence. So the intermediate model has only one copy of eutrophin. And then there is a severe model the MDX eutrophin minus minus, absence of two genes, no compensation, mice down, okay, at five months. So what we noticed is that there was a strict correlation uh, between connexin 43 remodeling and the severity of disease. You can see remodeling here in the MDX eutrophin minus minus, uh, you can see the arrowheads, here, or the arrows, uh, in the MDX, and more prominent in the MDX eutrophin. You could see that uh, in the MDX and uh, with different antibodies, there is an increase in connexin 43. Quick question. Yeah. So is, is the severity endpoint measured in, in my uh, number and severity of arrhythmias? Is it is it death? I mean, what is the? It's death. It's arrhythmias as well. Okay. Uh, and, and there are many more phenotypes in this CVO. Is there a concomitant? Is there, is there a concomitant hypertrophy, ventricular hypertrophy in these animals? Uh, it's dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. Yeah. What's the contract contractility, Diego? Uh, between the models? Or just, just in terms of what I'm, you know, just thinking about like, what's making the connected, is, the contract, is it not getting the same like contractility signal to go to the right place? You know what I mean? The connection. So like, is, is, is the heart still beating the same rate? And do you see, like, is the sarcomere looking okay? Or look at that. In the, uh, in the skeletal muscle? No, no, in the, in the, this is cardiac muscle, in the right? heart? Yeah, in the heart. And like, what kind of detail have been done in terms of that? I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna see a, a relationship between 
the uh, the uh, connection 43, this regulation of remodeling and the microtubules. Okay. And, uh, uh, regarding contractility, um, I'm I'm not sure. There is there is a very direct uh, effect on arrhythmias and fibrosis that may affect the contractility, but I don't think that there is a direct effect of connexin remodeling and the contractility. Yeah, I guess you can do it way around, but yeah, okay, cool. Okay, so this uh, effect uh, of remodeling is exacerbated if we um, stimulate mice with isoproteinol, um, and this effect happens in a matter of minutes. You could see the very, very uh, uh, widespread lateralization when isoproteinol is injected into the mice. So these are uh, the arrhythmias that I was telling you about, um, not at the baseline level, but with isoproteinol stimulation. Um, the MDX and the MDX eutrophic minus minus models, they both develop arrhythmias in the, uh, in the form of uh, single, excuse me, double and triple uh, PVCs, premature ventricular contractions, AV block, ventricular tachycardia, and fibrillation eventually. The arrhythmia score uh, that uh, we designed for this system was higher in the MDX compared to the wild type and even higher in the MDX eutrophic double knockouts. Also, isoproteinol challenge led to lethality in the DMD mice. You can see the MDX here uh, dying at 24 hours upon isoproteinol injection and the double knockouts double in a matter of hours, okay? So we stimulate, we challenge these mice with isoproteinol catecholamine, and these mice die 24 hours, two hours, four hours. So, so far we have DMD stressed hearts, we have arrhythmias, we have lethality, and we wanna know if Connexin 43 remodeling plays a role. So far, we have a good correlation, but is it playing a role? And we decided to use a pharmacological approach. And, and this is one of the reasons I came here, uh, because uh, we use peptide mimetics uh, to, um, uh, to answer this question. So we used GAP26, and GAP19, one that is at the extracellular domain, uh, so extracellular loop one, and another one that is intracellular, and uh, GAP19 is a known peptide that interacts with the regulatory domain of connexin 43 and keeps the hemichannel closed. Uh, so what we did is we preemptively injected these peptide mimetics, either GAP19 or GAP26 into the mice, and then we challenged the mice with isoproteinol and recorded the, uh, the uh, potential arrhythmias. And what we found is that isoproteinol stimulated mice in the presence of GAP26 or 19 have not, had not, uh, not no arrhythmias. So the peptide mimetics that are selective for the hemichannels were able to protect these mice from developing a disease. Can I ask a quick question? Is there any um, adaptive role in the lateralization though? Like, right, like how early in pathology does this happen? And like, is this remodeling first adaptive and then become maladaptive? Like does timing matter in dosing this stuff? That's a good question. The, uh, the disease in the MDX, uh, which is mild, starts between four and six weeks, uh, but you can see lateralization beforehand. 
Okay. So precedes the onset. Of precedes the uh, the peak of acute uh, uh, pathology in the MDX. Uh, in the MDX, you're dropping double knockouts. Uh, you can also see uh, lateralization before the symptoms arise. Uh, so I. Uh, probably at the very beginning is not maladaptive, but uh, at the end, it's conscious. It's very detrimental. Okay, arrhythmia scores, again, uh, were down comparable to wild type levels in the presence of the peptide mimetics that selectively uh, affected the uh, hem channels. Okay. Not only in the MDX, but also in the MDX, you drop in double knockouts. And the lethality produced by isoproteinol stimulation um, was rescued of, uh, for the most part in the MDX, iso treated. And in the MDX, you drop in, it was, there was a modest benefit but the mice died anywhere anyway and we are still trying to address why if these mice have arrhythmias corrected they still die so maybe many other uh, issues uh, that are independent of the hemichannel activity in these mice yeah yeah my, my, uh, um, yeah what sort of arrhythmic activity do the different people show in the um, in the absence of beta adrenergic stimulation? Do they? Oh, there's there's none. So in the absence of isoproteinol? Yes. There's none. So so it needs the uh, beta adrenergic to unmask the um, the, the arrhythmic phenotype. That's interesting. Yeah. So. And and that happens in a matter of minutes, and 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 we uh, we showed that the isoproteinol, for example, uh, produces more lateralization. <coughs> so a question that came back from the reviewers uh, was whether this effect of lateralization of connexin 43 uh, existed only in mice or humans. And you can see, for example, we have two DMD uh, cardiac tissues from patients that died uh, from the University of Maryland, uh, both died from different uh, uh, pathologies, one from heart failure, the other one from um, um, uh, lung embolism, and they both had lateralization, as you can see here, as you can see here. You can visualize this better here. Okay, this is the intercalated disc, and orthogonally, you could see the lateral side of the cardiac mouse side in DMD patients as well. But if you treat with a uh, with a peptides and you do a microscopy, let's say, do you still see any change? Oh, you still see the lateralization. The peptides does not uh, reverse the lateralization. What it does, it closes. Or in, it it inhibits uh, it inhibits the activity of the connexin uh, ladder. So you use the two different peptides, right? So twenty nineteen binds to the extracellular uh, domain, right? And then twenty six is the connexin. So gap junction the extracellular space is kind of easy in gap junction, right? But the CT domain is still uh, free, like there's no difference. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I don't, I, I, um, connection 43 CT domain between hemichannel and the gap junction. Yeah, I, yeah, that's 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 a great question that we also ask ourselves. The uh, um, if you want to inhibit the uh, lateralized connection 43 in an acute mother, uh, man, you can do. You add the peptide mimetics, they will act for a few hours, let's say, right? If you want to do it uh, as a chronic kind of uh, uh, study, 
that's going to become a problem because eventually the paramedics, I, I would predict, eventually they will act upon the uh, gap junction channel, the junction and connection for the field. So I think it's very good for acute kind of uh, uh, problems in, in this system. Okay. Sorry, to clarify, I think what Warren was getting at least is that you have a, a cell uh, permeability signal. Do you have something to get the peptide into the cell that is targeting the intracellular domain of connects, like GAP26? Say that again, sorry? So GAP19 is the outside of the connection, right? Uh, GAP19 is inside. inside. So GAP26 is the outside one. Yeah. Inside. So for the one that's going inside the cell, do you have a sequence to take that peptide into the cell? Yeah, it's in its own sequence. Okay. It's built in. You don't have to add it. It's okay. the nonapeptide that has a uh, uh, membrane penetration sequence. Yeah. It goes in. And we had to uh, inject it 10 times more uh, concentrated because it had to go through the membrane. Yeah. So we had the lateralization, and, but we wanted to understand the mechanism responsible for it. And so what we know, what we knew at that time is that Connexin 43 is a target of multiple PTMs, or uh, 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 translational uh, modifications. Phosphorylation, acetylation, sumoylation. You can, you can, pay, you can say many of those. Um, we knew that phosphorylation play the role in ischemia. Uh, and we knew that re connecting remote is a rapid event. So we sort of focused on post-translational modifications and particularly on phosphorylation. So what we did is we uh, compared um, connecting uh, enriched uh, preparations from ventricular lysis and submitted them to mass spec for proteomics analysis. And we noticed that um, a uh, triplet of serines in, at the uh, CT domain, at the uh, regulatory domain of connexin 43, um, was hypophosphorylated in the dystrophic mice, in the heart of this dystrophic mice. So we validated those proteomic uh, findings by using phosphoantibodies against those, those residues. You could see the decrease in phosphorylation of connexin. We used Colampi's uh, antibodies, custom phosphoantibodies. And using those antibodies in uh, sections we also noticed that the phosphoconnexin was still localized to the intercalated disk. So we had in MDX, we had connexin at the intercalated disk and connexin, the, the good connexin and the bad connexin, but this phosphoantibody recognized only the good connexin, the junctional connexin, meaning that the lateral connexin did not have phosphates in those residues. So then we uh, also validated the findings. Yes. Sorry, you said it doesn't have uh, phosphorylated residues, but you mean specifically those phosphorylated residues? You also noted 365 and many others. Yeah. Many others. I'm talking about the triplet of serines uh, um, 325, uh, 328, and 330. Do you think any of those lateralized ones are phosphorylated as yeah, well? Maybe different. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So we validated these findings in, uh, with human tissue or uh, human connexin. And we, again, there is a decrease of connexin 43 in DMD tissues, heart tissues. And the only phosphoconnexin that was detected was at the intercalated disk, but not the lateral connexin. So then we used a genetic approach and also to provide a, uh, some causality that the phosphates in the triplet of serines, these particular triplet of serines 
uh, were responsible for the lateralization. Because so far, all we know is a correlation, but we need to show that if we have a version that is phosphomimetic or a version that is phosphodead, that would change or would uh, alter the uh, amount of lateralization. And what would that uh, cause? So what we did is we uh, knocked at Glenn Fishman lab across the, uh, across the river. That was, yeah. so again, do you know how we are phosphorylated? Is it like PKA or? We'll talk about this. Uh, it's been described the CK1, uh, in kinase one, and we also and also suggested cam kinase two, and we demonstrated that cam kinase two, uh, when it's not oxidized, uh, it can phosphorylate. The, uh, it's like on fat it's like only on the not on the latter phase, but between the like for second cam peat nodes, like there's like micro domains where PKA can phosphorylate. Uh, uh, Yeah, I, I, I think that is acting upon very close to the kinetic phase, but we, we haven't done any. But there must be some compared, uh, compared to that. Yeah. Okay, so what we did is we obtained uh, a knocking version, knocking versions of the a phosphomimic or a phosphodead uh, uh, mice in which the three serines were replaced by glutamic acids or by alanines. Glutamic acids have negative charges. They mimic phosphorylation. Alanines that, that do not allow any kind of phosphorylation. So we have the two extremes, the phosphomimic uh, when we have the S3E or the phosphodead, the S3A. And what we expected if our hypothesis was true, is that when we incorporated these mice into an MDX or a dystrophic environment, we would see no remodeling in the case of S3E and remodeling or even exacerbated remodeling in the case of S3A. Uh, so with this, we had very, very good correlation with this, we are still trying to address a few issues, and I'll, 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 I'll mention it uh, shortly. Okay, so we um, we looked at the pattern how they run on a gel. Um, typically, because of the phosphates in wild type, this connexin forty three runs a little bit slower because of the P three. P2 and P1 isoforms, phosphorylated isoforms. But in the MDX, it runs a little bit lower because it also has the P0 isoform without phosphates. And our mimics, the, uh, uh, this two, the S3E runs similar to the wild type or more similar to the wild type. And this mimic runs more similar to the MDX corroborating some of our expectations. Okay. So now we wanted to know what was happening with the remodeling of Connexin 43. And this is the MDX S3E. And we were very happy to see that there was very, very little or no remodeling at all. So all the Connexin was confined to the intercalated disk, the mutant connexin that had S3E, okay? And the, with the S3A, there was lateralization, but still we cannot address or we cannot understand why there's no more lateralization than MDX. And we are still trying to find it. So then we did, a series of analysis to see what were the consequences of connexin, uh, the mutant connexin 43. Um, we performed a uh, hemichannel activity assay that was Mauricio, Lily, and Jorge Contreras, our collaborators, they developed or they, they used. Um, and essentially, what it does is that ethidium 
or thidium bromide gets in through the open hemichannels. Uh, and, uh, and that happens when there are open hemichannels and active hemichannels. And that was true for the MDX, not for the wild type, for the MDX, for the MDX S3A, but not for the MDX S3B. So there are no hemichannels that I showed you before. And of course, there's no ethidium bromide in the S3A. Okay. <clears throat> also, we did some biotinylation uh, assay in which the biotin in, in um, isolated hearts perfused with biotin. Biotin doesn't get into the intercalated disc, but it does get into the lateral side. So it binds to all those uh, lateralized proteins, and then we can pull down with streptavidin and run a gel and a Western blood. And what we saw is the reverse, that S3E didn't have the lateralized biotinylated connexin 43, supporting our notion that S3E protects from remodeling. At the cellular level, we looked for uh, 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 reactive oxygen species and calcium um, uh, um, and calcium uptake. For um, for ROS, we isolated cells. We loaded them with a sensor, which is DCF, and looked at uh, oxidative stress in this uh, in this cell uh, in these cardiac mouse cells, and in the presence of S3E, all the oxidative stress with this higher slope went down to wild type levels. And you could see, uh, and, uh, and uh, you could see it here. You can appreciate it here. And also, the MDX uh, uh, hearts contain more GP91, which is the catalytic domain of uh, NOx2, which is a source of ROS. So it was higher in the MDX and it was lower in the MDX S3E as well. You can appreciate it here as well. This is for calcium homeostasis um, um, upon hypoosmotic shock that sort of mimics uh, uh, um, uh, stress doing um, mechanical stress. And we can see that in the S3E, there's no, uh, the levels uh, of calcium uh, or the, uh, the calcium dye, the calcium dye, fluo uh, uh, 4A, um, they are back to wild type levels, as you can see. So it seems to normalize several aspects of a dystrophic cardiac mouse site. The ROS, the, uh, the, uh, uh, of course, the oxidative stress, and the calcium homeostasis, the absence of lateralization. So, but what happens with the arrhythmias? So now we forget about the peptamemetics, we replace the peptamemetics with this genetic approach. And we look at MDX S3E, there were no arrhythmias <laughs> compared to MDX or MDX S3A. And the MDX S3A, again, didn't give us more arrhythmic profiles than the MDX, still trying to figure out what's going on there. But we were very happy to see that the S3 was able to reverse or uh, prevent the arrhythmias from taking place. This is the arrhythmic profile that it comes back down in the presence of S3E, not only in the MDX, but also in the MDX eutrophin plus minus uh, uh, S3E minus. So um, the peptamemetics 
as I mentioned before, were not good to test, for example, what was happening long term because of the possibility that they could uh, also affect the, uh, the gap junction channels. But the genetic approach well, gave us this opportunity. So we looked uh, not only at four, three, four, five months of age, which was uh, representative to all the experiments that I showed you before, but also after one year or 14 months or 16 months and see what was happening with remodeling and all the downstream effects that uh, uh, occurred because of a remodel. So first of all, the MDXS3 did not remodel even in aging mice at 16, 18 months. You could see that here. Localization is at the integrated extreme. Then fibrosis, we could see a rescue, but the rescue was partial, was not complete. And it sort of makes sense. In the end, we were a little disappointed that we didn't get a huge rescue of fibrosis. But if you think about it, dystrophy is still absent. So it would be very, very hard to get a uh, complete rescue. So we are pleased now with that, with that finding. Um, so fibrosis, you could see the level of rescue there, significant but modest. Um, ejection fraction also significant but modest. And survival after ISO challenge, still the same kind of curve. The S3E protected from isoprotenol induced death. Uh, recently, we tried not only the MDX model, which is the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the mild models, but also the more severe models. The MDX eutrophin double knockout and the MDX eutrophin plus minus uh, or heterozygote with S3E and S3A. And what we noticed is that um, the S3E was also able to protect the MDX uh, eutrophin plus minus, okay? but not the minus minus. More severe phenotype, couldn't touch it. Actually. Uh, it was exactly the same. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. So when, when you have your three stains was correlated, what happened downstream in terms of signaling? So what would that signal for? Um, you have all those three settings was correlated. Is it an adapter or is it? A... We are we are looking into that, uh, and and I, I'll show you later on that there is a um, uh, there, there are multiple uh, pathways that are uh, either activated or uh, they are turned on. For example, it connects with the microtubules and it allows the microtubules to be normalized. And 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 the uh, it allows um, for reduction of the microtubules, uh, the density of the microtubules. Um, uh, it also connects with uh, um, the sodium channel NAV one point five, which will increase its activity. So there are multiple effects of connecting B phosphorylated, and that is what we wanna explore further. So I'm going to uh, take you to a slight different uh, 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 path now, the skeletal muscle, because we uh, identified something that is uh, interesting, but it's uh, very preliminary, but I wanna share that with you for a few minutes and then we'll go back to the heart. So the skeletal muscle is a syncytium. And um, as such, if you think about it, it doesn't really need connexin 43. Connexin 43 couples two hemichannels. 
and two correct milestones. Here, the uh, muscle fiber doesn't need a connection, right? So we expected not to see any effect in the skeletal muscle. Right? Fiber is a system. Um, but yet the, uh, the skeletal muscle as a whole had enhanced levels of connexin. So I was a little bit puzzling. In our minds, it wasn't needed, but in MDX, there was more connexin than in the wild type, okay? So we were wondering if connexin for three also played a role and we set, up, uh, set out to try to find out. Uh, so first of all, we wanted to see if the um, S3A, uh, but sorry, the S3E remodeling uh, played a role in the skeletal muscle or the uh, S3A, S3E. And, uh, and that was a question that the reviewers asked uh, when we started remodeling in the heart, they said, hey, what, what happens in the skeletal muscle? Can you show us that the effect in the heart is not indirect uh, coming from the, uh, uh, from the skeletal muscle? And what we did is um, one, an activity assay, another one, uh, uh, a morphological or histological uh, determination to show that in the MDX S3E, which is very good for the heart, it didn't really affect the fibrosis in the skeletal muscle. You could see that in the diaphragms, okay? And the activity also, the S3E, didn't do much to the oscillation of the diaphragm in, uh, 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 in, in uh, ultrasonograms. Um, so the uh, connexin remodeling in the skeletal muscle doesn't do anything, but there is yet still, there is more connexin 43. So we looked at the, uh, the sections of this uh, uh, dystrophic skeletal muscle, and we noticed that there was a pattern there, but it wasn't. Uh, as clean as in the heart. This is the skeletal muscle. It was punctuated. And when we looked more, first of all, it was punctuated. It was only present in the MDX, in the dystrophic muscle, but not in the wild type or less in the wild type. And um, when we looked in more detail, those points, this punctuated pattern, were not in within the fiber proper. They were, they localized to mononuclear cells that invaded the skeletal muscle, in particular um, macrophages. So we became very interested in the macrophages. This is staining for uh, a 480 uh, for macrophages here. And you could see that they localized to the, um, uh, interstitium. And then we went on and uh, did some uh, uh, cell sort um, for this population, the F480CD11B, and noticed first, uh, or validated first, that there were more macrophages in the MDX than in the wild type, which, is, which makes sense because the dystrophic muscle attracts more mononuclear cells to come eat the, uh, the, uh, the dead mu the muscle. And, but not only this, but connexin 43 was also upregulated uh, within those dystrophic macrophages, okay? Then we did some, uh, um, uh, measured some activity, hemichannel activity in the presence of gap 19 of the, um, cell sorted fraction, macrophage fraction. And you could see that in the absence of uh, gap 19, there is a lot of uh, hemichannel activity uh, emanating from this uh, mac dystrophic macrophages that they could go down or we could take it taken down 
comparable to a wild type when we add uh, uh, um, increasing amounts of gap printing. So now we have, uh, we, we were very interested in uh, the role of macrophages or the, uh, the role of uh, connection for the three hemichannels from the macrophages. Um, and we made this macrophage uh, tissue specific knockout for connexin 43. And we saw some uh, benefit, but again, it was modest. It wasn't really striking. And we saw, for example, a decrease uh, in fibrosis and, and a slight decrease, uh, increase in uh, grip strength activity of the skeletal muscle. Um, but it was modest and we are trying to figure out what it is. Um, one experiment that may help us understand this is that we saw, in addition to macrophages, we saw, for example, other mononuclear cells that are positive for connexin 43. For example, the satellite cells or uh, uh, regenerating very, very small caliber regenerating fibers that are positive for connexin 43. But then connexin 43 is gone when the fiber uh, uh, reaches a certain threshold. Diego, was there a change in the number of macrophages that got into the diaphragm if they didn't have connection? Say that again? Was there a difference in the number of macrophages that were invading without connection? Well, that's, that's our hypothesis and we don't have the data. Our hypothesis is that, uh, and similar to uh, another paper uh, about sepsis in which connection 43 from the macrophages are the attractants or uh, allow for some of the uh, factors to be secreted uh, from the hemichannel activity of the macrophages that would attract more macrophages. So it would create a loop. And definitely we want to explore that possibility. But we were a little bit disappointed that we don't have a lot of uh, uh, a very, very striking effect there. And we fear that. Uh, if we look for number of macrophages at this time, we won't get much of a difference. So we want, we would like to uh, to conditionally knock out not just the macrophages but also the satellite cells from connexin forty three. So I guess a little bit of follow up to that: Do the macrophages without the connexin forty three uh, are they less likely to coalesce? Uh, spatial distribution, I guess, in three dimensions in the muscle. And if so, what does that mean for their ability to perform various functions, secreting signals, et cetera? Is that, it, is that known? Or? No. Okay. <clears throat> I wish I knew it. And, uh, but I just wanted to, uh, the, uh, the portion, the project on skeletal muscle ends here. Okay. So it's very preliminary, but I just wanted to mention that Whatever, what we have in the heart for connection 43 may not apply for other tissues like a skeletal muscle. Could be completely different. We could see some benefit, but a completely different mechanism. And that, that's the concept that I wanted to leave you, but I, we don't have further details. Okay, we go back to the heart and I want to establish, or we wanted to establish a connection between Connexin 43, phosphoconnexin 43, and the microtubules. So we know then that in a normal environment, non DMD environment, um, dystrophin, which is subsarcolema, um, binds to the microtubules and to actin, okay? and it's able to stabilize the system there. The very organized and transverse microtubules or longitudinal microtubules without any um, orthogonal microtubules, they are responsible for keeping the, uh, the heart in check with respect to ROS, reactive oxygen species, with respect to the uh, oxidated form of chamkinase 2, uh, which is a, a direct consequence of uh, uh, a decrease in uh, oxidative stress and is uh, 
And all this is responsible for keeping Connexin 43 phosphorylated, keeping it uh, uh, confined to the intercalated disk and would give the, uh, the system a normal rhythm, okay? This is in a wild type environment. What happens in a dystrophic environment? In a dystrophic environment, dystrophin is gone, which is, I uh, didn't mention, dystrophin binds to the microtubule. It's a microtubule associated protein, right? Um, dystrophin is gone. The microtubules become hyperdensely uh, or hyperdensed, uh, very tight and inflexible and orthogonally disorganized, meaning that there is a transverse microtubule, but also it reorganizes um, orthogonally. And that would be bad because it may lead some of the factors that are transported or trafficked uh, by the microtubules. It may take them elsewhere, for example, the lateral side, but that's, uh, that's a speculation. But what it is, is that the, uh, in the absence of dystrophin, the microtubules become disorganized, okay? Uh, hyperdense and disorganized. That leads to X-ROS, enhanced ROS, uh, that is dependent of NOx2, and enhanced oxidative chamkinase 2, the elimination of the phosphates from connexin 43, the lateralization and the arrhythmias, okay? So we were wondering if, because we always, in, in the back of our minds, we said, okay, we have this protein, a structural protein, and we're studying connexin 43. What does it have to do with muscular dystrophy, connexin 43? But now we think that they are connected by the microtubules. And if the microtubules are wrong, it's not just connecting, but many other factors could be wrong, okay? Microtubules may affect, I don't know how many other factors. Okay, so what we did is we studied the microtubules and we looked for an association with connexin 43 lateralization. So essentially we used uh, pharmacological compounds that are being used out there for the treatment of gout and uh, the inflammatory or the treatment of cancer, colchicine. So there is the, the, uh, the, um, um, the microtubules are dynamically regulated. You could see that there are the monomers or the dimers that are uh, bound to GTP that they polymerize into the filament. And colchicine is slows down the polymerization or inhibits the polymerization of the microtubules, okay? So it could go the right way because the microtubules in muscular dystrophy are, are hyperdense. We wanted to reduce the density of the microtubules. This is what with the paclitaxel um, we are planning on using later on, but we haven't, we don't have data. We don't have a lot of data yet. Okay, so what we did is we treated the mice with uh, colchicine and noticed a reduction in the, uh, in the density, uh, in the hyperdensity. You could see, for example, that the ROS was diminished by looking at uh, GP95-FOX, which is the catalytic domain at, uh, of NOx2. Um, oxidative, calcium commodulin was down um, and phosphoconnexin was up. That was all good. Just with the treatment of colchicine. We didn't touch connexin. So, sorry, when you say that um, camkinase goes down, you mean the activity or the, or the no. okay, levels? Levels, we haven't measured. Okay, so in the presence of colchicine, so you have it here, have it here. Um, there's no uh, remodeling or less remodeling, which is good. There is uh, decreased hemichannel activity, which is good. Okay, uh, we are we are here, and 
decreased uh, arrhythmias, which is good too. Okay, so we treat the mice with colchicine and we see a correction of lateralization and a correction of the arrhythmias. So now we wanted to know if, as I mentioned before, the microtubules may affect thousands of different uh, targets, but is this process mediated by S3A? And, and now we did the same treatment of con uh, colchicine, but in mice that were MDX S3A, okay? without phosphorylation and with forced lateralization. And this is what we got. We didn't, we saw lateralization nevertheless. Uh, so we treated with colchicine and the lateralization didn't go away, okay? That was because of the S3A. At the arrhythmic uh, level, we saw that again, for example, colchicine was able to correct the MDX, but not the MDX S3A. And this is the, uh, the latest kind of results and the, the, the more intriguing kind of results. So you could see that the, uh, in um, association with the, uh, the microtubules, uh, the MDX treated with colchicine reduces the, uh, the, uh, the density of the microtubules, but it doesn't, it can't uh, touch the microtubules or the density in the presence of S3A. Yes. Sorry, did you do an experiment that you did before with the S3E? Because didn't the S3E completely reverse oxidative stress? So if you did it with the S, like it's not completely linear, right? It like feeds back on itself because, oh, go ahead, sorry. That's the next slide. Okay. And, and that's that's the most, uh, to me, remarkable kind of uh, result. Uh, so this doesn't exacerbate oxidative stress alone, the S3A? S3A? Yeah. Like, if you show the S3E completely reverses the oxidative stress in the MDX mice, right? S3A, what it does is it, it doesn't allow colchicine to do that. Um, so we can see at the level of density here and here, and at the level also of organization of the microtubules. So we can appreciate at this histogram, directionality histogram, this is where the transverse microtubules should be uh, looked at. And this is where the orthogonal, the, uh, the dysregulated microtubules should be looked at at 90 degrees. So these are microtubules that reroute completely orthogonally out of the transverse microtubules. And what we can see is that colchicine, where is it, uh, can um, normalize uh, the um, orthogonal or can reduce the orthogonality of MDX, but not of MDX S3A. So S3A blunts colchicine from normalizing the microtubules at the level of density and directionality. Now, and we are coming to your question, and we were very pleased to see that. Uh, so we say, okay. 3A, S3A, but what about S3E? Okay, that uh, S3E force connecting to be at the integral element. And, uh, and what we saw is that in the presence of S3E, no colchicine, nothing, we noticed that the microtubules were organized, were organized with S3E. So it's colchicine goes one direction from the microtubules to the connexing, but S3E goes the reverse direction from the, co from the uh, connexing to the microtubules. That is something that I wanna emphasize. And also it corrected the, uh, the uh, density of the microtubules. Here is the model I wanna leave you with, uh, that we, it's, uh, it's a working model. So we have colchicine, we treat the, the dystrophic mice with colchicine and we are able to correct phosphoconnexin 43. 
But now we treat phosphoconnexin 43, for example, S3E, and we are able to correct the microtubes. So we want to argue that there is a loop there, a bidirectional mechanism of regulation, an amplification loop with enhanced anti antiarrhythmic activity. For example, colchicine produces more phosphoconnexin, which in turn corrects more the microtubules, which in turn corrects or produces more phosphoconnexin. So this loop keeps going and amplifies the same. And for example, we, uh, uh, to support this claim, we saw that, for example, um, S3E increases the interaction between uh, phosphoconnexing and uh, uh, connecting with the microtubules. S3E, not only S3E, but also colchicine. And we also validate these findings in with human tissue, non DNA. So now we are interested in knowing, in addressing or uh, uh, see what happens if we can block this interaction, block this loop with peptide mimetics, for example, applied either to hearts or applied to mice, for example, with milk exosomes. And, and this is something that we would like to explore further. So this is our working model, updated working model, that uh, in which in a dystrophic cardiomyocyte, uh, we can see the uh, the gap junction channel here, Oops. that is phosphorylated. And since the uh, the system is dystrophic with a lot of ROS with this regulation of CAM kinase, et cetera, there is uh, uh, the loss of uh, phosphorylation and the presence of hemichannel. Sorry. Okay, we're on the advanced here as well. Yeah, we're on the advanced With the presence of open and active hemichannels. That is what happens in a dystrophic environment, all this would lead to arrhythmias, fibrosis, heart dysfunction, and uh, recently also described the density of the microtubules and the uh, directionality of the microtubules. And all these defects uh, are gone if we mimic connexin 43, uh, if, if we mimic uh, phosphorylation of the triplet of serines if we inhibit microtubule polymerization, or if we reduce oxidized CAM kinase. And you could see that the rhythm of the hemichannel is gone or is inactive. The, um, the rhythm is, uh, is, is normal and there's less fibrosis, better heart function, better organization. Um, so all this led to uh, uh, one, uh, two companion papers, one in the JCI, one in the uh, JCI Insight, uh, in collaboration with Jorge and Natalia Jorge Contreras and Natalia Shirokova, with a commentary by uh, Robin Shaw and uh, Jeffrey Sapitz uh, in the JCI, and recently in a, a follow-up paper in the uh, AJP Heart. So I want to um, uh, thank uh, my my crew here, uh, Eric Himmelman, the uh, the uh, the driving force of all this project. Uh, he uh, he's the first author of the JCI. He is uh, he had a, an AHA fellowship to do that. He's a PhD student. Uh, then the uh, Julie Nowet, who followed Eric, she got also a uh, NIH uh, uh, pre-doctoral fellowship from the, uh, uh, Ruth Kir uh, Kirstein. Uh, Delong Zhao, who joined us recently, he also got an AHA fellowship. Pat Gonzalez is the former PhD 
a member who graduated and he's the one who did all the experiments with uh, peptide magnetics. He also had a, a, an, an F31, Alex Jung, uh, a NASA student, and then my uh, collaborators, uh, grant collaborators and paper collaborators, Jorge Contreras and Natalia Shirokova, who have been moved recently to uh, UC Davis. Um, then we have Mauricio Lillo, who uh, uh, the, the Golden Hands, who made, uh, who uh, got a uh, position recently at uh, Rutgers. Uh, Lifewad, uh, she in my department. Uh, uh, Hong Li Proteomics, Lifewad, the uh, EKG. Uh, my external collaborators, Paul Lampe, Fred Hutchinson, Glenn Fishman of NYU. Xander Warrens and George Ripley at uh, Baylor. And everything has been done under the uh, uh, support of uh, Jun Satoshima, our chair. Couple questions. First, go on. So when you check the phosphorylation of these three sites at a certain region, have you checked any time with the nutrient stress condition, with glucose or something? With the what? If I check. Any nutrient stress condition of this phosphorylation, whether there is any change which happened there? Uh -huh. the phosphorylation and the nutrient stress levels. Okay. So it's pretty complicated when you start bringing in microchipos as well, right? Because there's more going, it's like we have gun hemi channels trafficking connexons, right? Um, so are is the dephosphorylated hemi channel? Is it that though that I mean, in my head, you know, things don't just float out of integrated disk. So are they directly there and never get phosphorylated because they never need cap kinase there, kind of getting at what Yassine's saying? And so like you know what I mean? Um, so are we thinking that or are we thinking that they are it's originating in the disk and you know we don't need, yeah, that these are questions that we ask ourselves every. I think it'd be really cool to like nail down where in the trafficking pathway that phosphorylation. Yeah, we don't, we don't know if this, the, um, if the lateralization is a product of lack of phosphorylation of connexin that is already at the intercalated disk or connexin just goes wrong from the trafficking activity and goes to a lot other side and, and, and whether the, New mechanisms coexist, but this is what we, what we think. Yeah. All right, just one more question. Yes. Okay. It's a very interesting one. Tyler, you have, indeed, I did not see, you show evidence that this, are you suggesting that this lateralized, I mean, those channels are open and we have evidence for that? And if, yeah, we do, we do. We do have evidence. The JCI inside paper, okay. there is nitrous relation of the hem channels that opens. Yeah. But, but in that case, that's like a chart. Uh, channel, right? Where, where it's just to be an excitable, right? That's like an open channel. I don't know if it's the gating of those hanging channels. It's an open channel, right? It's, it's just not. Uh, yeah, it's just not. Yeah, yeah. It's not the excitable. It's like a, it's like an IK channel. Yeah, it's not the excitable. 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 Yeah, it's not the um, could the dynamic mechanism be the changes in the actually uh, connection and the integrated disk? You presumably if they lateralize more, there will be less in the integrated disk. And that answer, if there's more lateralization of connections, that's going to reduce the integrated disk uh, gap junction. And that is a yeah, that's an alternative alternative mechanism that we are exploring. We think that if there is a reduction at the integrated disk. Uh, there is a reaction, but it is compensated by the fact, uh, it wasn't so clear when I stated, um, connexin 43 in muscular dystrophy goes up in the, uh, in the cardiac mass or in the heart, uh, which is different from any other uh, cardiac disease that it's been studied. So yes, there may be less uh, or fewer uh, channels at the, uh, at the junction, but uh, they may not be at the critical level to slow down the uh, conduction of these of these hearts, but we are exploring the alternative that, for example, the S3E also through ZO1 and uh, uh, and 
uh, NAV 1.5 uh, also uh, have uh, some kind of uh, remaining activity. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so next we have the lunch for the training. Diego's got to fly up soon. So I'd like to thank him again. And